Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time this morning to devote to worship. I have no announcements for you, and so we'll jump right in. I ignored it for months. It wasn't that big of a deal. I could deal with it. Except then it happened in front of my wife. And she looked at me with that sense of, what is wrong with you? You see, I took a step towards her. I was standing in front of the, uh, the dishwasher, and I was putting away a dish or something, and I took a step towards my wife, and I couldn't take another step because I was in sudden and unexpected pain. My, the outer side of my toenail on my right, uh, the smallest toe on my right foot, that, that part of my toenail had caught on my sock, and my torn, toenail had torn in two, all the way to the quick. And I looked down, and there was blood, unexpectedly. It was not a pleasant moment. Olivia at first was confused. My wife was at first confused. And then she looked down and she realized I was not just like faking something, right? Then she, she was then uh, not pleased with me when she asked what happened. And I said, yeah, it's been happening. It happens about every other month. It's been happening for about a year. And um, I kept on thinking that it would grow back and that it would grow back together, and then this would stop happening. And, and she looked at me and said, you, you gotta do something about that. And, and I told her that she was right. And uh, I told her I knew that what they needed to do, uh, that they needed to remove that side of the toenail that was ripping off, and uh, they would burn the base of the nail with a little bit of acid, and then it would just stop growing back. And so that's how I found myself this last Tuesday uh, with my foot in the hands of a very capable uh, podiatrist by the name of Dr. Klein, an excellent fellow. And uh, he was doing exactly what I just described. And uh, it's funny how there's always something they don't tell you about a procedure, like just a practical detail. Like if you're going to have a piece of your toenail removed, they're going to have to use Novocaine. And driving home with a Novocaine foot is a bit of a challenge. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was uncomfortable. It was actually far more painful than I expected. But uh, it's just something that had to be done. And as I talk to people this week, I, and they'd ask, how are how you, how you doing? And I'd say, you know what, I just had a toenail worked on and, and it's been an awkward week. Uh, I didn't expect to have to take a chunk of the day off to keep my foot up that high. I mean, that, that was not in my plans, right? And what, the funny thing was is a lot of people have had stuff like that. A lot of people have had work done on their toes or ingrown toenails seem to be the thing. It's not, not something that people bring up often, but a lot of people are uh, familiar with it. And no one bats an eye at it. It's just one more thing you got to deal with in the med with dealing with the medical community, dealing with healthcare. And for me, it's been kind of a healthcare intensive week between my toe and then uh, we did an allergy consultation because I'm allergic to everything green in the state of Missouri. And then I'm rescheduling a lung a lung appointment. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking to a lot of doctors and doctors' offices this week, and that's just part of life. We don't bat an eye at having interaction with health care. <laughs> Except for there is one aspect of health care <clears throat> that we, we do kind of bat an eye at. There's one aspect of health care that we don't tend to talk about. We don't tend to talk about mental health. Right? We just don't tend to acknowledge it or deal with it. We have people that are highly trained using God-given gifts to focus on healing people's hearts. We have people that are highly trained with God-given gifts to focus on healing people's lungs and kidneys and even toes. And we don't bat an eye at going to them. Yet going to a person that is highly trained using God-given gifts to heal the mind, that is something that we don't tend to talk about. We don't want to acknowledge that we need that. It seems to bother us. I asked this question then with full respect for Dr. Klein, who worked on my toe. Great guy. I'd rec If you, you got a problem with the toe, go to Dr. Klein. I asked this question with full respect to Dr. Klein, 
What's more important, your toe or your mind? Right? I, didn't, I don't think I had realized how much we avoid grappling with mental health and how much of a problem this could be until I met Carl. 20 years ago now, hard to believe, 20 years ago now, I was a, a, a pastor, a street pastor in Durham, North Carolina. I, I would go out with my three friends in seminary and we would set up a card table or multiple card tables and we'd put out a home cooked meal and we would share this with the people who were panhandling and, and they would, uh, they would panhandle at the intersection of 15501 and I-40, this major four-lane through thoroughfare divided street, and I-40, a major highway, and it runs between, it's between Durham and Chapel Hill, and so there's a lot of intersections there, a lot of uh, traffic. And then there's a wooded corner where these guys, they would sleep in tents in the woods. And uh, we'd set up this card table and we'd set out a meal and people would come out of the woods or come off the intersections and they would sit down and we would bless the food we would eat and then we would pray. And, and these were the guys that they weren't coming to church so we were bringing the church to them. And it was an amazing uh, that was the first place I was called pastor, and it, it, they meant it. It was, it was an amazing community. There was one guy that we didn't see, though. We didn't see for nine, ten months and it, it, of doing this. His name was Carl. And his friends would say, you know, can we, can we bring back some food for Carl? And, oh, yeah, of course, here's some foil. We'd wrap up whatever we were bringing and send it back for Carl to have a bite to eat. And, and we began to learn and to hear a bit more of Carl's story. Carl was just a guy, worked in a, a car battery factory in North Carolina, lived by himself, was doing just fine. And then he started to develop an anxiety disorder. He could not be around people, his anxiety. And he never sought treatment for it. He never went to a mental health specialist. He never went to a counselor or a therapist or a psychiatrist or anything like that. And he lost the ability to be around people. And so he lost his job and then he lost his home. And then he was camping in the streets, camping in the woods, panhandling on the streets. And Carl, eventually, uh, he did come on out. And he's a great guy. He had a very quiet, very quiet, had a sly sense of humor. I enjoyed talking to Carl, right? But then he would disappear for long stretches because that anxiety would just get the better of him. It was a mental disease. It was crippling. It cut him off from his family, from his friends, from his community. It was hard to watch. There is a moment in scripture that reminds me of this, that connects to this, where Jesus heals someone that has been cut off from his community due to a mental disease. It happens in, um, in Luke, commonly called the healing of the garrison demoniac. Right? We read about it. Let me read you this story. The disciples and Jesus sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met with a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven, had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened.
When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. This is a mental disorder, right? How do we know it? We know it's a mental disorder for two reasons. First, the way that they talked about the things that they could not touch in the first century. Like you talk about healing someone's arm, you can touch the arm, right? But you talk about healing someone's, well, what, what's the part of you that you can't touch? We talk about a, a soul or a mind or a psyche. The, in the first century, what they would have talked about is your spirit. And if your spirit is sick or ill or broken, they would say it's demon-possessed. It's been impacted by demon, impacted by evil. It's, it's, and so Jesus heals and cures someone whose spirit, whose mind has been broken, who's sick. I mean, this, it has all the hallmarks of a mental disease. Like he, he is separated out from his community. And, and then when he is healed, we read that he was sitting in, at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. I've had that experience with Carl. When Carl was in the midst of anxiety, he was cut off far from everyone else. But when he was in his right mind, sitting next to Carl, you'd never guess. Carl always managed to dress in uh, khakis and uh, in a polo shirt. Right? He, he could walk in right now and sit down, and you, would, you wouldn't think anything of it. Right? The mo this is the most obvious example of mental disease in Scripture. But if you read closely, it's there in other places as well. In Luke 4.36, when Jesus begins to teach, the response to when he first begins to teach is, he preaches, he speaks with authority, so that even the unclean spirits come out. It is a sign of Jesus' authority that he can heal not just what he can touch, but he can heal what he cannot touch. He can heal the unclean spirits. He can heal toes, and he does. He heals those who are crippled, and he heals minds. Right? Read the Gospels, and there are multiple times when Jesus has brought people to heal. There's this refrain, and many people who, brought pe many people who are crippled, many people who are demon-possessed were brought to Jesus to be healed. It's like the, those, those are the two aspects of, of how people were sick that were brought to Jesus. They were broken in body, and they were broken in mind. They were sick in mind, body, and they were sick in mind. And, and this is what Jesus does. He heals them. It is not something that is explicitly pointed out because if to a first century Jewish person, if you had pointed out that you were healing a person's mind, that they would have said, well, duh, that's part of a person's person, right? It's part of the, the challenge of translation. Often translation is as simple as, what's the word for boat? This is the word for boat. That's the, okay, that's the set. There are times when the words don't line up exactly. And this is one of those moments, right? When the Hebrew and, and the Hebrew and the Jewish faith talks about the word heart, it's not talking about the, the pump. The, that we think of this pump, this, this piece of muscle right here that's pumping to keep our, 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 the blood flowing. That's not what the word meant exactly. When, they, when you re read the word heart in Scripture, it's not this pump. What it is is the core of you, right here in the center of you. And if you think, if you just look at a person right here at the center, is what connects everything. My legs, my arms, my head, it's all connected right here. And so the word heart in scripture, probably better translated as core, the center of you, the part that holds everything to, together. Right? And, and the word for soul, right? the word for soul is not something ephemeral that, that you can't touch, right? The word for soul in Hebrew, better translated as your life, right? It's the thing that makes you alive, the entirety of your life, 
Right? And so we start reading places like Deuteronomy 6, 5, where it says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and might. And that's not a great translation. It would probably be better to say, love the Lord your God with the core of who you are, with everything that is part of your life, with all of your might. Right? When it says uh, in Psalm 23, the, the Lord restoreth my soul, Psalm 23, 3, right? Is it really the Lord restoreth my soul? No, it, a better translation would be, the Lord restoreth my life. My entire life, everything about me that is alive, right? The entirety of Andy. Jesus didn't make a big deal out of the, the two aspects of what he was doing, healing the body and healing the mind as two different things, because the, Jewish, the Hebrew language, the Jewish faith, didn't see that there was a division between body and, and mind the way that we do today, right? They would have said that, they would have understood that there is the core of who you are, that everything is connected into one person, and that one person needs to be healed. And Jesus is here to heal you, all of your life, your entire person. And there are parts of you that can be touched to be healed, and there are parts of you that cannot be touched. Both of them need to be healed. Now, you know, it's, it's funny. After decades of the scientific studies on how this works, I can point to scientific studies that, that support this very thing. Right. If, you ever, if you have ever heard the term psychosomatic, psycho, mind, somatic, soma, uh, Latin for body, right? Psychosomatic is that there is this deep connection between mind and body, to which someone of the Jewish faith in the first century would have said, duh. But we, we're, we can start to quantify and measure how this works now. Like if, if I'm really stressed out, what happens is my, my body, really, because my mind is stressed, my body releases this chemical called cortisol. And cortisol is what gets you ready for the fight or flight, so that ability to tense up and to do something, right? That's cortisol. That's what's driven by cortisol. It does things like uh, suppress the, the, uh, your immune function because you don't need to have an immune response when you're running for your life. You need to focus your energy on running for your life. Right? It, it, so, it, and so... The problem be being, if I, I'm stressed continuously, if I'm having a continual anxiety issue, that continual flooding bo your body with cortisol will lead to heart problems and lung problems and weight gain and, and sleep problems, right? It, it, it can, there's a direct connection there. And, and so if you'd ask someone who is constantly stressed and is flooding their body with cortisol and they're starting to have heart problems because of it, is that a mind problem or is that a body problem? Well, it's just a problem, and it involves both, because we are intrinsically one person, heart, body, mind, soul, spirit. It's all just one person. I've seen estimates that one-fifth of people, well, at some point in their life, have a health problem that is significant enough that it, it needs to be treated by a mental health specialist. Right? One-fifth, at some point. Right? So one-fifth, statistically speaking, if you're, you're probably not going to need. Like one-fifth, 20%, like you might be in the 80% that will never need to talk to a mental health specialist. I will tell you that if you'd asked me a decade ago if I was going to have to talk to a podiatrist, I would have said no. Like, so first, we don't know who it is that will need to talk to a mental health specialist. Right? It, it could be me. If it is, okay. Like, I could need to talk to a mental health specialist at some point in my life, and that's okay. So to, to learn about this first is to make sure that we understand that going and talking to a mental health specialist, that's okay. That's part of health care. That's part of taking care of ourselves. That's part of being healed, and that's what Jesus desires. That's why people are given these gifts to be able to be used to heal each other, to be able to love our neighbors. So that's the first reason we're looking at this. The second reason we're looking at this is because even if you're never going to need to go to a mental health specialist, one of your friends is. That's almost a given. Like 20% means that you know somebody who needs to talk to a counselor, a therapist, a psychologist, someone like that. And to 
learn to treat it like we treat Andy going to the podiatrist. When I said I had to go get a, my toe cut on, like there was absolutely no response that, that was other than like, yeah, well, that, that must have hurt, right? There wasn't any shame to that. There wasn't any like, mm, are you sure about that? Are you broken? Yet that is somehow how sometimes how we respond to people seeking out mental health treatment, right? There's something wrong with you. Well, yeah. If, if a person needs mental health help, mental health healing, I hope they get it. I gladly support that. Tell me about it. Let me know how it goes, if I can do anything for you. Right? To be able to model that approach to it so that we are loving our neighbors and supporting them and the, in the, them getting the health care that they need, whether it's their toes or their minds. Now, at what point is it that we would need to seek mental health treatment? It's kind of like any other healthcare thing. When did I know I really had to go get my toe worked on? It's when it became a problem and I couldn't take another step because I was suddenly <laughs> bleeding from my toe, Ugh, right? When, when we stop being able to do the things we need to do. And that's the same thing with mental health. When we're not able to control our emotions, when we're having sleeping problems, when we're self-medicating substance abuse, changing in pro changes in performance at work or school, withdrawing from social situations, unexplained physical illness, excess an excessive anxiety, worry, or sadness, frequent nightmares or tantrums, all of these are the types of signs, like the things that get in the way of us living the life that we need to live. And at that point, it's time to call and call your insurance and say, where's the closest mental health specialist I can find? And you start probably out, probably start out with a therapist or a counselor, someone who is trained to help folks. And if that, if that per therapist or counselor says, let me send you on to someone with more training, at that point you go on to a, a psychologist who has more training or a psychiatrist who has even more training, a psychiatrist being the one who can prescribe drugs. And taking drugs for mental health, well, it's something we need to do. Like we take, how many of us take pills for a day for our cholesterol so that our bodies can function well, so that we can function well? We, we take pills for cholesterol, for blood pressure, for, for how many different types of pills, for aspirin for, on a daily basis for our heart? We take a daily pill for many things. Taking a daily pill so that our mind can function well, to get our, our mind to work as it, it needs to, and that, that, that's just one more thing that we might need to do. It's just part of healthcare. I'll, and it's just something we, we may need to consider. My friends, I pray that your toes are healthy because standing, sitting still while, while someone pulls out a toenail it's not my idea of a good time. But even more so, I pray that your minds are healthy. I pray that we are able to be healthy in all parts of our lives. I am deeply thankful for the God-given gifts and talents that we have access to, the people who have trained all their entire lives to be able to serve and help us so that we can stay healthy. And I'm going to tell you the truth. If I had to pick between the two, between having healthy toes or a healthy mind, well, what would you pick, right? I'm going to dare say that our minds are more important. As I think about my friend Carl, I don't know if he had healthy toes, but I'm fairly certain he would have traded any problem with toes. He would have accepted any of those to be able to have a healthy mind again, to be able to grapple with the anxiety, to be able to handle that in a way because he did not, he did not want to be cut off from his friends and family. Right? That was not something he would have ever chosen for himself. I hope that you never need to seek mental health treatment, but if you do, please get it. Please accept it. Right? And if your friends or your family need it, please support them. Please be there with them and help them know that you care for them so much that if that's what they need to do to be healthy, that's part of caring for the entirety of their person. God has graced us with people with great talents and gifts to serve and to heal and to make us whole. I pray that we are each willing and able to take advantage of those amazing people. Amen. Let us pray. 
Lord, bless our toes. Bless our toes that they might never need, to need the treatment of doctors. We thank you for the people who care for them. And we pray even more fervently that you would bless our minds. Keep them healthy. Keep them whole. And when this ceases to be the case, grace us with the people who, who can serve and heal and help them be what you call them to be. be a, let us be healthy and whole. We pray that you would bless our schools, that those who are making decisions in our schools and, and our health care and our health departments, that might, they might be wise and patient in this time of great uncertainty, in this time when we, there's just so much that is challenging, there's so much that we're not quite sure how to handle. Mm -hmm. We pray for this election that is coming, that it might be peaceful, that it might be clear. We pray most of all, giving thanks for your son, whose kingdom we are heading towards, a kingdom of forgiveness, a kingdom of healing, a kingdom in which when we gather, we will all be made whole. Thank you. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you this day always. Amen.